One of my favorite all-time movie lines is from the mockumentary This is Spinal Tap, where band members are standing over Elvis's grave in Graceland. One of them sighs and says, well, it really puts perspective on things, doesn't it? Before another replies, well, too much. There's too much perspective now. I sometimes think astronomy is just like that. Too much perspective. Here we are, lodged on one of the arms of a typical spiral galaxy with roughly 100 billion other suns. Meanwhile, we now know that the universe contains 100 billion such galaxies, meaning that our sun that we used to think was so special and so unique is simply one out of roughly 10 to the 22 similar stars. That's a one followed by 22 zeros. Rather puts things into perspective, doesn't it? Too much perspective, perhaps. But Jill Tarter, former longtime research director at SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, looks at things quite differently. For her, the enormity of the universe carries with it a sense of unbridled optimism. Trying to detect alien signals through the vastness of interstellar space isn't just a great technical challenge. Success would mean that someone else out there managed to evolve long enough to develop the means to send such a signal in the first place. As she puts it, from the tyranny of light speed, we learn about their past. But if we succeed in detecting a signal, we learn that it's possible for us to have a long future. And that is such an important message that it makes it worthwhile working on this project. Now that's some perspective I think we can all welcome. So SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Let me, let me warn the viewers, and I do this at my own peril because I may very well be cutting our audience in half or perhaps more, that this, uh, this show has absolutely nothing to do with alien abduction. This show has absolutely nothing to do with Roswell or, or with any other tales you might have heard of uh, aliens in your backyard. This is serious scientific research. Right, this is the real deal. This is the real deal, and I'd like to throw it over to you and say, okay, what is this? What is SETI? Where did it start? And, and then later on, how did you particularly become involved? Okay, SETI is an acronym, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. Right. But having said that, I also have to say, that's a misnomer. We don't know how to find intelligence. Um, I assume you're intelligent because you've right. come to visit me, right? But uh, in figuring out intelligence at a distance is something we can't do. Right. So we use a proxy. We use technology as a proxy for intelligence. And so what we're trying to do is use the tools of the astronomer. Radio telescopes, in this case, optical telescopes in other sites, uh, to try and figure out if we can see evidence that someone out there is using some kind of technology that we can sense over the enormous distances between the stars. Sending us a message, sending us a, giving us a beacon. That's right. Uh, generating a signal that doesn't look like astrophysics, doesn't look like Mother Nature, but looks like something that was engineered. So what kind of signals would those be? Give us, give us a description, broad-based, of the sorts of signals uh, that we would, we would be looking for that are non-natural. Non-natural. So um, consider optical. Um, how about a flash, a bright, bright flash of light that lasts less than a billionth of a second. Mm -hmm. We don't know of any transient astronomical sources that can do that. Right. But lasers can. Right. So you take a laser, you take a big telescope, you focus it, and you send out a laser pulse. Right. And you can encode all kinds of information in that. And it arrives at our telescopes looking nothing like Mother Nature if you build detectors which can count photons fast enough to realize that you just got a whole lot of photons in one nanosecond, right? right? So that's optical SETI, and that didn't start until sort of the 2000 time scale because the, um, the technology that you need, the receivers, weren't affordable. They were being used by the military before that, but they weren't something that scientists could afford. Now we can, so now we're doing optical SETI. The historical study has been radio searches. Right. And there, you're looking for um, signals that are compressed in frequency. So the optical signals are compressed in time, last a billionth of a second or less. Right. Here, we're looking for uh, signals that have a lot of power, just sort of at one channel on the radio dial. Because nature doesn't do that. Right. Nature is emitting because you've got atoms or molecules, uh, lots and lots and lots of them, a big ensemble, 
and they're moving relative to one another. So even if each atom emits uh, a particular frequency, because of the relative motion, that emission is spread out in right. the frequency domain. So we, with technology, can send very narrow band signals. That's one thing, and that's traditionally what we've looked for. We're beginning to be able to use the, um, the correlator technology here and the imaging technology here at the um, at Allen Telescope Array to look for signals that have a lot of encoded information, look for right. signals that have a repetitive um, uh, cycle to them, right. even if we don't know how to decode them. Again, it's the sort of thing that nature doesn't do. Uh, there are all kinds of different signals you could look for, and the more compute power that we have to throw at this problem, the wider we can make our net. But this idea of a single tone, sort of a, a dial tone, if you wish, an attention-getting signal, uh, still remains a valid one, and that's what we're looking for. If you can just give us a little bit of history as to, as to how SETI came to be what it is now, uh, and how your role, how, how you got involved, and how you got excited about it, because I think that's a wonderful story. Well, SETI as a scientific discipline started in 1959, the publication of a paper in the journal Nature right. by Giuseppe Cocconi and Phil Morrison. Mm -hmm. And these physicists suggested that we go looking for interstellar communication at radio frequencies, particularly they suggested the, uh, the frequency associated with the hydrogen um, atom mm -hmm. because it's the most abundant element in the universe. So that paper was the scientific birth of SETI. The next year, in 1960, Frank Drake, right. who was working at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory in Green Bank, West Virginia, had been thinking independently about SETI and oh, really? had been, he'd been planning on a search. He kind of got scooped when this paper came hey, out. I didn't realize that. that oh, cool. yeah. Um, <laughs> it was all done in secret until this paper came out, and then they were a little bit upset that somebody had sure. beaten them to the punch. By but months. anyway, yes, by months. <laughs> so, but in the spring of 1960 uh, at Green Bank, uh, Frank used uh, the Tatel telescope to listen for signals from two nearby stars. Right. Tau Ceti, Epsilon, Aridne. That was called Project Ozma, and it was the first radio search. And he was doing exactly the sort of thing we're doing now, looking for these narrow band signals. He could do it only one channel at a time. Right. We now do hundreds of millions of channels at a time it's because technology has improved. But sure. that was the first observational program. And since 1960, there have been 120, 125 projects that I've been able to uh, find in the literature and document. Um, it seems like a lot. Wow. 50 plus years, people say, well, if you've looked for 50 years and you haven't found anything, must be nothing out there. And people just haven't got much of a concept about how vast the cosmos is. Um, how large this cosmic haystack that we're trying to search is and right. how many different dimensions and all of these different um, ways that signals could be generated that we haven't yet searched for. So it's, um, it's a daunting undertaking, but you know, it's really fun to be part of an exponential technology. Things are growing so fast and we can do so much more today than we could do last year that it's, it's encouraging. Our tools may, may finally, after 50 years, be getting to be commensurate with the size of the task. And will be improving ever, ever more rapidly, as yeah. you, as you mentioned. It was technology that got me involved in so SETI. So tell me a little bit about that. My understanding is it wasn't as if you were yourself SETI obsessed when you were very small. This came almost by chance. Your, oh, your it was an accident. It was a very fortunate accident in my case. Um, when I started graduate school at Berkeley, uh, we, the the very first desktop computer, the first time we had compute power on the top of our desk, right. the PDP-8S was released. Wow. And my job, my first year as a graduate student, was to program that computer to run um, a, a, a spectrograph at an optical telescope that the university used as a teaching tool. It sounds like a graduate student job. Absolutely. <laughs> and you know, this, the, I always thought the, the slash S 
the S stood for stupid because <laughs> there was no language. You had to program this in Octal. You had to set all the ones and zeros. It had 11 instructions that it could do, and you could, you could make it run the world with those 11 instructions as long as you got the ones and the zeros in the right order. And so I did this, um, and then many years later, as I was finally leaving graduate school, Stu Boyer, uh, an X-ray astronomer, had mm -hmm. been listening to the talks that had been going on at NASA Ames Research Center about SETI and about the engineering study they had done there called Project Cyclops, mm -hmm. about how you might detect uh, extraterrestrial intelligence using a radio telescope. And Stu said, oh, UC Berkeley, we've got, we've got a radio telescope. My friend Jack Welch, he's got a telescope. I can piggyback. I can steal some of the astronomer's signals. And, and in, in the radio part of the spectrum, you can do that. Because if you, um, if you break the signal into multiple parts, you can just amplify it right. back. Be right. You can't do that at optical wavelengths. Okay. You get your hands chopped off if you try and take an astronomer's <laughs> photon, but uh, an optical astronomer's photon. But it works in the radio. So you just take the same data and you analyze it in different ways. <laughs> and great idea that Stu had, and the telescope he was thinking about was here at, at Hat Creek. At, at that time, out in that meadow, there so was So when was this exactly? What, this what? was uh, mid-70s. Okay. And at the time, there was this huge 85-foot telescope that stood out in that meadow, uh, and that's what we started with in a program that we called Serendip. Stu came and recruited me because somebody gave him that computer, and then somebody else told him that I'd once known how to program that computer. <laughs> <laughs> and he came and he, he said, gee, come join my team. And I, he gave me the summer report from the engineering study that had been done at NASA Ames, the Cyclops report. And I read that cover to cover in one night. And that's not easy. It was written by Barney Oliver, the engineer's engineer, right? <laughs> but I was, you know what? I was so hooked at the idea that I happened to be around at just the right time in all of the generations of, of humans with just the right skills to try and do an experiment to answer this old question. All we'd done in the past was ask the priests, the philosophers, the wise people, what right. should we believe, right? Now we could do an experiment and try and figure out what is. And that was what was so exciting, to be there at the right time, the right place, with the right skills to try and answer this question that no one had been able to answer. It's a funny thing uh, hearing you talk because science tends to get this, this reputation, often wholly undeserved in my view, of being staid, of being <laughs> detailed, of being not so interesting, of being very technical, boring. Not, and, and listening to you and understanding the quest, we're talking about really completely the other side of, of, of the whole equation here, if I may use a mathematical metaphor. People have been wondering for the longest possible time, are we alone? Is there anybody out there? And finally, the technology has reached a point where we can actually seriously, scientifically begin to study the question, and you're right in the heart of it. That's, that's an incredibly exciting, magnificent opportunity. I agree. I got hooked, and I've stayed hooked. <laughs> uh, I'm, I have the, probably the best job in the world, although sometimes it makes me want to cut my throat when I, when I can't find it funding for it. But we'll get you know, to when, that. I, when I talk <laughs> to um, young people, right. I try and counter this image that you just portrayed of science. And I try and tell these kids, if you are lucky enough to have a career in science or engineering, um, you never have to grow up. You never have to stop asking why. That should be a huge incentive, and not, not growing up. I, uh, growing old is inevitable. Growing up, that's, that's an option. <laughs> and some of us have decided not to do that, right? right. Um, it's, it's amazing to come in to work in the morning or at night or whenever it is and sit down and you formulate the questions that you want to work on. Uh, it isn't punching a clock. It isn't doing what someone tells you. You've actually put in the time it doesn't come easy. You have to do a lot of study. You have to develop some really good skills and a knowledge base. But having put that effort in, you get to spend your life trying to f answer questions that no one else has had an answer to. Let me bring it back a little bit to, to the land that I promised to go to, which is let's specify some aspect of the, 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 the length scales and the time scales that we're talking about. There is this, this uh, the speed limit that we have to deal with, which is the speed of light. And we know that uh, whoever is trying to contact us 
has to deal with that speed limit, unless there's some new physics that we're not particularly familiar with, um, which means that the signal, uh, we can figure out how long whatever signal they want to send will take because uh, it has to obey this particular speed limit and we have a sense of how far away they are. So my understanding is that the galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, this, this big thing, this big cluster of, of, of stars where we find ourselves now, which of course you can see in the night sky, is something of the order of what, 75,000, 80,000 light years across, right? End what? to end, it's 100,000 100, light years. Okay. And we're not quite at the edge. Right. So from our position on the Earth, to the far end of the galaxy, it's about 75,000 light years. 75,000 light years. Which means that if we're looking in the Milky Way galaxy, we're looking uh, at a signal which can take up to 75,000 years to reach us. Correct. From when it was emitted. There's a grand design spiral. Right. A beautiful spiral galaxy like the Milky Way. Obviously, we can't get outside the Milky Way to take, to take picture. a picture. Right. So <laughs> this is an analog, right? right. This is a proxy. Um, and you can see that we're not in the center, right. we're out towards the boondocks, out right. towards the edge. And right. if you were to look through the center and all the way out to the other side, right. about 75,000 light years. So there are a whole bunch of stars in there. And, and, and the closest star to us is, is roughly, what, about four, four, uh, four Proxima, light years? Proxima Centauri is our closest star, and it's 4.2 light years. So, so if we're trying to receive signals... Actually, our closest star is the sun. Right, and sure. it's eight light minutes away, as right. I learned from a Raisin Bran commercial when I was a kid. <laughs> and never let it be said that a Raisin Bran can help you become a great scientist. Exactly. I, should, I should say. So if you're looking at uh, if you're looking at receiving a signal from some planets around some of those stars, the range within the Milky Way, the 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 range is between four light years and and roughly seventy five thousand light years. Right. Since this is early days for SETI, I mean, it, we don't know whether there are any other technological civilizations in the galaxy. But we can be pretty sure that we're about the youngest. We've only had technology for a hundred years that's relevant for this kind of research. That's a hundred years out of a galaxy that's 10 billion years old. So if there are other technologies that could be transmitting, they're going to be older, yeah. statistically speaking. So since we're young and our, t our capabilities are at a minimum, we actually start looking close by. And then as we're able to build mm -hmm. up larger and larger instruments with more sensitivity, we shift our focus to stars that are farther away. So right now, we're actually doing something that's so cool because we couldn't even begin to think about doing this when I started in this. There's a spacecraft called Kepler right. that is continuously staring at 100 square degrees on the sky. And in that 100 square degrees, it's looking at 150,000 stars right. and waiting for some of those stars to blink because a planet has passed in front of them. And so far, Kepler has shown us 2,321 candidate exoplanets. And later this month, Kepler is going to be announcing a new batch of exoplanet candidates. So in that 100 degrees of the sky, we actually know where there are planets. And that's where we're pointing our telescopes. And on average, the stars in the Kepler field are six or 700 light years away. So that's really kind they're of that the reach. close. I didn't realize that's that. That's the sort of reach <laughs> that we have right now. Right. That's where we're focusing. So um, a couple of hundred light years. And, 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 and there's something, it seems to me, to be uh, fantastically inspiring about that because before we started this whole notion of looking for these exoplanets, these, these non-solar planets, planets around other stars, um, people had assumed from statistical arguments, from uh, their own particular philosophical basis, well, most stars should probably have, or many stars should probably have planets around them, but there was no empirical evidence. There was no right. way of getting that empirical evidence. But this idea that, yes, it turns out the more and more we see and the more sophisticated our probes are and our experiments are and our devices are, the more we actually get confirmation of this idea that, that it's not at all uncommon for stars to have numbers of planets that are surrounding them, even the ones that we can see, let alone the ones that we can't yet actually right. determine. That certainly gives the people who are of the view that uh, there might be 
the, the, the galaxy might be teeming with, with life and with other possibilities, certainly a great deal more, uh, more reason to be optimistic, I That's would right. say. Until, um, until 1992, planets were a good theory, but we had never seen any. And then the first three planets we found were orbiting this burned out cinder of a star that's called a radio pulsar. And we never saw the planets, but we could tell they were there because they were um, screwing up the very regular ticking of this pulsar clock. Right. Um, in 90, and then in 95, we began to find the first uh, planets around normal stars. And now we know of thousands. And I think most scientists would say, yeah, probably more planets than stars out there. Uh, it's, it's a, a there's a lot of real estate, and whether it's inhabited or habitable, that's a question, and it's a really timely question. Lots of people are getting excited. Yeah. Uh, you know, in the planet-finding community, people are just right on edge waiting for the discovery and announcement of Earth 2.0, right? An Earth-sized planet, Earth mass, orbiting a star like the Sun, at about the distance that the Earth is from the Sun, the right. eight light minutes, right. um, something that might be habitable. So there's something I read called the Fermi paradox. Yes. Uh, well, it's important to deal with that because paradoxes can be extraordinarily strong. We take Euler's paradox, the sky is dark at night, that ultimately leads you to an expanding universe. Right. Um, really very, from a very simple observation, a very powerful conclusion. Fermi said, in the 10 billion year history of this galaxy, if there had ever been another technological civilization anywhere or any when in this galaxy, then they obviously would have been able to uh, develop the means for traveling between the stars, and they would have begun to travel. And on any kind of model that you use, they will colonize the entire galaxy in a time that's short compared to, that to, the, of time. to right. the history of the galaxy. Right. But they're not here. So that means they can never have been another. We have to be the first. Right. Okay. The problem with that argument is being able to say they're not here. And again, I don't, I'm not, not talking not about there. Ann right. Allison abductions <laughs> from the streets of New York, right? Um, but that, actually, we can't say that. We've even so poorly explored our own local backyard right. in this solar system. We can't say that there is no evidence of uh, an extraterrestrial craft or markers or, you know, the, the, uh, the obelisk from 2001. Right. Um, and we also have this bias that space colonization is going to be big wet biology boldly going. Maybe that's not how it happens. Maybe it's small, um, really intelligent uh, little nanoprobes. Maybe they don't have to send their biology, they send the information and uh, we get, uh, th they recreate what they want to at their destination. We haven't seen any evidence for any of that, but it could be here. Uh, the best that we've been able to do is say, well, if they're in the, the Lagrange points of the Sun and the Earth system, those places where there's a lot of gravitational stability, you don't have to expend a lot of energy to stay in one place, to station keep. We've looked at some of those with in, in reflected light and with radar, and yeah, probably we would have seen a Battlestar Galactica kind of thing, right? Unless it was cloaked. Um, but not a small, not a small pro. Right. Um, so in fact, we can't make that very definitive, they're not here statement. And there are, there are other explanations which have to do with the fact that, all right, the entire galaxy may be colonized. That does not mean every star within the galaxy is colonized. There are diffusion uh, solutions to this problem that leave pockets unexplored. So don't know. Right. It is, it's not something to be sneered at. Sure. But I also think that um, the, uh, the last sentence of that Nature paper in 1959 is, is kind of the right approach to this. They said, um, probability of success is difficult to estimate. But if we never search, the chance of success is zero. Uh, so we're searching. Um, we may be wrong. 
We may be looking in the wrong way. We may not have yet looked in the right direction with enough sensitivity. Uh, it may be something else entirely, but we are trying to use the tools of the 21st century that we have to see what is. So you mentioned the originators. So Frank sat down to set the agenda for this National Academy of Sciences meeting at Green Bank about the question of life and intelligent life in the universe. Right. And so what do you need to think about? Well, what's the rate at which stars are being born? And of those stars, which of them are likely to be able to host um, planets for a long enough time for technology to develop? And if you have a planetary system, how many Earth-like planets might be in that system? And of those Earth-like habitable planets, how many of them will life actually begin on? And if you take all those life starts, well, how many of those life starts develop intelligence? how much of that intelligence develops a civilization that's technological right. and finally how long does that technology last how how many years are those transmitters turned on making this technological civilization visible we're beginning to get a handle I mean when Drake did this back in 1961 I think it was planets were a big open question right. Uh, now we can begin to deal with those first terms in the Drake equation. Um, the question of life, well, maybe we'll know something more about that in a decade or so as we explore our own solar system. If we were to find a second genesis here, a second place, an independent evolution of life on some other body in our solar system, like Mars or Europa or um, Ganymede or Titan, right? That's hugely powerful. Mm -hmm. If you find a second genesis in this one solar system, you know that life, at least microbial life, is going to be ubiquitous, abundant out there. Um, so we may know something more about the life term. Intelligence, that's, that's kind of hard. Uh, we have been really good at ignoring the intelligent species that we share this planet with. It's only lately that we have come to appreciate um, that a number of different uh, vertebrates are self-aware and are incredibly intelligent. Right. Um, doesn't stop us from, from doing them in, but we're at least now acknowledging that intelligence isn't only embedded in us. Right. Technologies, we seem to be it. And the big unknown is how long we're going to last, the longevity. So you take all those other factors, and to within astronomical accuracy, they're one, the unity, right? right? So the number of technological civilizations out there with whom we could possibly make contact is a, approximately equal to their longevity in years. So if technologies last for um, a thousand years and then they're gone, uh, that's a thousand civilizations out there in out of a hundred, a couple of hundred billion. Mm, it's going to be hard to find them. They're going to be, the, the closest one's going to be far away from us. Right. But on the other hand, if technologies are stabilizing and allow civilizations, technological civilizations, to persist for time scales that are on the order of stellar lifetimes, billions of years, tens of billions of years, um, then the nearest such civilization is going to be much closer to us and we have a much easier job potentially finding it. But we don't know. Um, let's see, Gott, Richard Gott at Princeton took the Copernican principle saying we're nothing special. Right. And you can calculate using that and how long we've been around as a civilization. You can calculate um, that with 95% confidence our technological civilization is going to last another 5,000 years. Um, not less than 5,000 years, or probably not more than, um, I think his upper limit's six or, seven billion, uh, six or seven million years. All right, so that's a big that's range. A, it's a big range. Right? And again, I love Phil Morrison. He always had these wonderful things to say. Phil said, in any science where the error bars are in the exponent, so you don't know whether the number is 10 to the 3 or 10 to the 8, Right. 
that's not a theoretical science. There you go. That's an I'm, I'm observational I'm science, uh. and that's what we're <laughs> trying to figure out. At some level, it's really very simple. We don't know, uh, and and if you're a scientist or, or of a scientific persuasion and you don't know, you find out, yes. you look, you, you search. One of the great things when you start quantitatively analyzing scientific uh, possibilities and experiments is that you get results that you weren't necessarily thinking about at all. Um, and, and, and an obvious example that which is trotted out by, by every physicist who's looking for more funding is you should fund what we're doing because look what happened that the World Wide Web was actually discovered at CERN. Um, and so you never know what you might find or you never know what might come in handy. And, and maybe that's just a, a practical device to make sure your particle accelerator is funded. But at the same time, it's true yes. that, that that's the way science and technology actually operate, that, that you, you try to quantify things, you try to be rigorous, you try to look at how you can solve the scientific problem. But in so doing, invariably, all sorts of other interesting opportunities and avenues open up. And again, getting back to this core issue that this is science. This is hardcore, real, serious science. Um, you never know what you might find, not only out there in terms of extraterrestrial signals, but even in the short to medium term, which of course is uh, is, is, is much is shorter and much more shorter <laughs> than it used <laughs> to be. You're, what you're talking about. Um, it's it's important, and and you never know what what can happen by finding. You get this wonderful nonlinear effect by by supporting science. Is that all sorts of discoveries happen in all sorts of different ways. Anyway, I've turned into a, a, a massive scientific promoter, which I, d I don't mind doing, but isn't really the purpose oh, of, but of, of what it is that we're. It's a good thing to be doing, and <laughs> and you know I couldn't. I, I'm just here in the choir cheering you on because because <laughs> I believe that completely, and uh, I don't know what will come out of these experiments that we're trying to do. Um, you can imagine small offsets that the pattern recognition that we figure out how to do could be used in a related science. But it's really the, oh my gosh, because we can do this, oh, well now, golly, we could do that. Who would have thought? We're always asked, well, what spin-offs? You know, right. you've, you've been working on this, what have you done? An interesting one that we got involved with, because what we're learning how to do is find signal in noise, for a while we were experimenting with radon transforms um, uh, rather than Fourier transforms. Uh, and turned out that the kind of algorithms we developed were pretty efficient for the early approaches to automated scanning of digital mammograms. Really? Cool. And it turned out that, so there was actually a, um, a clinical trial and it was judged, it, we weren't cost effective enough. There was a more cost effective way to go, but it was Isn't kind it? of interesting. Sure. I mean, that's what we were doing. We we're finding signals and noise, and right. that's what you try and do when you look at a mammogram, these right. micro calcifications. There are increasing opportunities that SETI is now opening up to try to benefit from uh, expertise around the world, of people who, who want to help they, uh, in terms of the, the processing analytics and, and, and so forth, right? That's my, my understanding. That's of right. We, um, we made a decision um, a few years ago that we wanted to make this an open project in any way that we could, knowing full well that this is not an easy job. Um, so we've done a number of things. We've taken the code that finds those kinds of signals matching them against node interference, deciding whether or not this is a good candidate to follow up on in the next observation. All that code we cleaned up and we published in the open source right. so that people can maybe pick things out of it that would help them do their job or take a look at it and say, oh, I could make this um, database query more efficient. And, and uh, so there have been a few people who have gotten involved with us and the code it's big, it's hard to get it up on your platform, right? right. And the other thing we've done is taken a lot of data and we don't store any data here except information about signals and candidates that we've found. Mm -hmm. But we've said for, for a better part of a year, we just said Friday afternoons, we're recording direct to disk. We're not processing the data. We're just recording the raw complex amplitudes as a function of time. We're putting that onto disk, and that's a source that people can go to in the cloud, 
and there's there's support for people to use resources in the cloud to data mine that to try and develop new algorithms against those data sets. Well, it's, a, it's a known fact, correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is it's a known fact that Friday afternoons are the preferred time for alien transmissions. <laughs> there <I> mean, you <laughs> go. I, I'm not sure how that scedule came about. Right but before they go off go. for their, their beer. Of course, they've calculated for the time that, exactly. that it would take. Exactly, and, and the rotation of the planet. They know where this, uh, the uh, right. telescope is. Yeah, um, and then the third thing we've done, so we have we have code out there that we're sh we'd like to share with anyone who wants to get involved. We have data that people can access. Um, and the third thing that we've done is to develop a citizen science project. Hmm. So we have all of these, I, I've got nine billion channels of radio data that I'd like to search through for every target. And I'm doing it hundreds of millions of channels at a time. Right. But as I go through the spectrum from 1 gigahertz to 10 gigahertz, where the universe, is, nature gives us a quiet window right there. It's about the only signals in there are the cosmic background radiation. Right? It's a very quiet window on the universe and from, from, a, from the surface of the planet, because at frequencies higher than about 10 gigahertz, our atmosphere starts to con okay. contribute. So this is the terrestrial microwave right, window. Right. Love to search through that. Um, there are places in the spectrum that we allocate by international treaty to communications and to other kinds of services. So they're really loud. Right. There are a lot of signals there. Sure. And, and typically when we go through those, we find all these signals and we're not yet fast enough to decide whether we've seen them before, whether there's something we want to follow up on. And rather than do an incomplete observation, we just skip those frequencies. But you know, it's not really very smart because that's a signature of Earth. Those are frequencies on which we're transmitting. If in fact there were very nearby civilizations, they might have already detected some of that information being broadcast on those frequencies. And thought this is a good one to use. And, and transponded it back, yes, but we're right. skipping it. So we've decided to try and see if we can use the public to help us there. So we're taking small bits of data because this is an isolated facility and there isn't a great huge fiber pipe into here. Right. But we're, s we're squirting as much data as we can out of the observatory into the cloud, and then there's a citizen science um, f application called SETI Live. And people are presented with two dimensional views, frequency versus time, and we ask them to mark any patterns they see and tell us whether they see those same patterns in the other directions that we're looking at to try and help us discriminate against interference. And tell us, we're not just looking for lines, anything that they see, any kind of pattern. And we're trying to have this happen fast enough so that by the time our own processors are coming back saying, yep, from that particular frequency range, we have these candidates that we want to follow up on. We can also have a set of candidates or not right. coming in from our volunteers that we also want to follow up on. And then they they have to stay with us because they're the ones that sure, are going to. Sure, they flagged it and they. And, and they're, they're going to help us see whether that signal is still there when we go right, back and right. whether it goes away when we move the telescope right. away. And so this. Uh, so this is an opportunity for people to really be involved, to do real science, to really be involved in, 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 in the whole endeavor right. rather than just hacking into their friend's website or doing something like that. Right. And it's, it's a big challenge to get this. We're trying to close a feedback loop in about 60 seconds. That's huge. That's, that's a huge challenge. Um, we haven't gotten it quite right yet. I think maybe I'm told next week we ought to be really? next making, week? It, wow. making it in real time. <laughs> um, so we love people to help us. And then they can um, join in and, and do the next step, which is, OK, well, gee, we found these signals. And they're clearly interference. What interference? What's causing that? Um, we can use people to do all kinds of web searches to figure out, oh, that's coming from that particular satellite constant. And, and therefore, if we want to look at that frequency, hmm. we should do it and schedule it when that satellite's below the horizon. Right. So we can have people help us get smarter. And again, people will provide the data sets to eventually train machines to do this kind of thing. They can eventually learn by themselves. Yes. And, and 
we just really want to get people involved. I mean, I am such, uh, I'm Pollyanna, right? I'm all hugely optimistic, but I actually think that if people get involved with us and can begin to think about the kinds of images we were looking at before, the galaxy, the cosmos that's full of galaxies, the Earth which from space has no geopolitical boundaries. Um, if you get people appreciating themselves in this larger picture, then perhaps we can set the, the um, stage for cooperating, cooperating on the challenges that we have that don't respect national boundaries. We can deal with these global problems if we can see ourselves as a global species. I don't know, maybe it's crazy, uh, but I think we're just right there with uh, social media and the mobile technologies. I think we have a huge opportunity here to connect people in a way that allows them to see themselves from a totally different perspective. I think SETI's like holding up a mirror, right? And you see everybody on Earth in that mirror. And even though there are superficial differences, they're all here on Earth. They're all Earthlings. And they are so hugely different from anything else that might have evolved out there. It just might be a pivotal time with the right concept, the right meme, and the right technologies to infect the globe with this idea of um, the fact that we only belong to one tribe, and that's the Earth. I hear you talk about a cosmological perspective. There is this sense, uh, as we had both mentioned previously, that all throughout human history, when you talked about the Copernican principle and so mm -hmm. forth, we thought that we were so very special. We thought that we were the center of the solar system, which we at that point called the universe. We thought uh, we were the only life form with intelligence or consciousness or whatever. And it seems like we, one could make an argument that the march of science has been uh, paring away, layer by layer, our, our self-importance in terms of where we are and what it is that we're doing. Do you encounter in your job this sense of pushback from people because of religious or personal grounds say, no, 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 that's just a complete waste of time what it is that you're doing because we necessarily must be special. We necessarily must be uh, a people who, uh, who, who are unique. That this whole quest for looking at some affirmation of our non-uniqueness is in itself misguided because we are de facto unique and I can prove it because of this book or that book or, or, or with what this guy says down the street or something like that. Is that, is that a source of frustration for you or is that a source of, uh, uh, of limitation? Or, or Certainly that happens. Um, however, think about it. Organized religion has been around for a very long time. Our cosmology has changed drastically over the millennia. Right. Organized religion's still with us. It's managed to somehow bend and shape and encompass what we've learned, right? Sometimes not very gracefully, um, but I take, I take uh, hope in the fact that Steven Pinker says we're getting kinder and gentler now than we ever were. My sense is that it's only the fundamentalist religions that postulate a very special relationship between Jesus Christ and humans that have this problem. The, the, ad the major atomist religions uh, we, we've had them write papers. They can very easily come up with um, humans are created in the image of a god. The most godlike thing about humans is our intelligence. Therefore, the search for intelligence elsewhere is just the search the for manifestation of, of God's, God's handiwork. Or whatever. Okay. There are lots of ways of telling that story and being comfortable with it. It's when you um, postulate a personal relationship with a, a deity that it gets to be sticky um, because does your relationship have to be mirrored every place else in the, in the cosmos that there might be life? And I'm a scientist. Um, I got excited when I was a graduate student about the opportunity to do an observation that might tell us what is rather than having to ask somebody what we should believe. And I'm still 
involved the mindset that says we should explore to see what is. If that's uncomfortable for various um, cultural or religious reasons, doesn't change what the universe is. And as a scientist, I think it's um, a responsibility and a privilege to try and explore and see what really is out there. Let me ask you about spreading the message a little bit more concretely. You talked about some of uh, the citizen science aspects uh, of, of SETI, but SETI also has a broader outreach mandate and, and a way of uh, reaching out to kids and to, uh, and to teachers and to adults and the general public and so forth and so on. Um, because this is such an inspirational story, this is such an inspirational pursuit, this is something which has such broad-based resonance with, with almost everyone who's human almost everyone who's human who I want to meet anyway. Um, so can you maybe tell us a little bit more about what SETI's now doing and what, and what you'd like to be doing even more in the future about, uh, about programs for involving more and more people, aside from the ones that were perhaps in addition to the ones that, 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 that you've mentioned already? Well, we um, have the opportunity in the past we've had and we hope to have in the future continuing opportunities to bring in um, undergraduate university students for uh, a 10-week program called Research Experience for Undergraduates. Now one of the things about the SETI Institute, which most people don't appreciate, is that there are a handful of people there who work with me on the search, and now with Jerry Hark, who's directing the, the Center for SETI Research. But there are dozens and dozens of astrobiologists working at the SETI Institute interested right. in microbial life right. and the extremes of life on this planet and the extent of life uh, elsewhere. So we have this huge scope, suite of scientific research being done. And so we can bring in students and we at the SETI Institute are all comfortable with this being one continuum of right. uh, exploration. And the students really have a great time. I mean, we bring them here for a week. And how cool is this? We spend two days here at the site. We do lectures in radio astronomy and interferometry and SETI. They do experiments here in the afternoon using the telescopes. Um, and then two days we go down the road to Mount Lawson with our astrobiologists who have field sites for extremophiles in that volcanic park. And so they get to see the connection and the combination and right. the they get to live at this cool place and figure out how to cook dinner for 20, <laughs> right? <laughs> Which is always a, a an experience, <laughs> right? So um, we'd love to do more of that kind of thing. Right. Uh, we have a Wednesday colloquium, actually now going to move to Tuesday, lunchtime colloquium, where we put out peanut butter and jelly. And we invite anybody in the area to come to the colloquium. And we put it on our YouTube channel, our SETI channel on YouTube. And we're reaching the, the, the most popular talks get a few hundred thousand views wow, 100, for an hour for an hour long lecture. I think that's 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 impressive. Pretty cool. And we'd love to, to make that even better. We put we put some effort, as you will with this program, into doing some editing so it, it looks nice. But what are you saying? You're saying it has to be all cut all over the place? We've said all, too many too many horrible things. We have to edit <laughs> it completely. No. It's all garbage. No, but you'll it make it down look, to two minutes. No, but you'll make that screen visible to the, the viewer at home, well, right? Well, uh, the viewer has to put an effort. <laughs> Gosh so, darn it. So we make it look pretty. We could do more of that. Right. We have developed um, curriculum for, uh, for school use. It's a full year-long curriculum of integrated science that works on um, we call it voyages through time, so origin of the universe, origin of the solar system, origin of life, and evolution of each of these, origin of technology and its evolution. This whole long story that um, young people, this is ninth grade, uh, beginning of high school, really like because the story is so compelling and it's being done in an inquiry-based mode, very hands-on and a lot of activities that the learning happens sort of incidentally True. because the story's fun. And because people are passionate. They're yeah. naturally passionate. I mean, you mentioned extremophiles, uh, and, and we talked a little bit about that uh, in, a, in a general context as well, about, well, we're not really sure what to look for because, when we're, because we have our own perspective. But just the amount of work that these astrobiologists have, have done in terms of getting an understanding as to what bizarre, to, to us, 
bizarre uh, circumstances life can seemingly exist that we would 20 or 30 years ago have discounted as, well, that's just impossible. Oh, you absolutely. Can't, you can't have anything in there. And then it turns out the robustness, the breadth of, of life possibilities is, is so much larger than what we might have uh, been led to believe. And the idea that these fascinating new developments are linked to the sorts of uh, of things that you're doing, that you have a real synthesis between physics and biology and chemistry, mm -hmm. makes this, a, I would think, a particularly uh, uh, exciting and passionate field. People use this word interdisciplinarity and they throw it around all over the place and there's this idea that you throw an economist and a, and a nuclear physicist and a, and a historian together and great things will happen and most of the time you... you yeah, you look what happened when the physicists went to Wall Street. Well, that's, don't, 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 don't get me started there. But anyway, so interdisciplinarity necessarily does not, does not work necessarily. But, but in my view, it certainly happens uh, when there's a reason for it. Right. And, and here there's a, there's a clear scientific there's a clear scientific reason we for have, it. We have a wonderful um, example at the SETI Institute. We have a scientist um, who was cracking rocks and looking at the oxygen chemistry uh, that happens when you crack a rock and the energy is released. That release. There's actually some chemistry there. Wondering about origins of life. That's how we got started. That whole discipline has maybe turned into an eventually very effective earthquake prediction really? story, which may give not just minutes, but hours and days of indication of an huh. earthquake. Cool. And of course, I think I deal with, with um, politics and uh, people's points of view, but I, the, the, just think about how you would ever test this, right? How it's really... Well, I guess it's after. It's difficult. Maybe after the fallout. Well, anyway. that's what you're. Le that's what you're doing now. You're. Um, you. You. St you get the data. You make a prediction, and then you don't tell anyone until after the fact, and then you can say, "Well, here's what we predicted." Right. And here's but the moving it to the next step, and actually thinking about moving populations out of harm's way, um, with the tsunami warnings, uh, the uh, that's that's so imminent, and people know which way to run, uphill kind of thing. Uh, but this is a larger geopolitical, sure. uh, human nature kind of thing. But this is your metier now, because you used to be the, the director of research at SETI for quite a long time and, 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 and led it uh, splendidly. And now, for reasons that, quite frankly, I still can't understand, you've, you've decided not to do that anymore and become a full-time fundraiser. Oh, it's uh, not. It, it's uh, just because it's so necessary. I, 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 was, I was kidding. I was kidding. I, I realize, I realize no, one no one becomes a fundraiser out of will. I, 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 well, maybe not no one, but no, no one I'd ever like to talk to becomes a fundraiser out of will. So you have, you have stepped up to the plate, as they say, and you have uh, sacrificed yourself and, uh, for, the, for the good of the SETI team. Um, so I'd like, you to get a, uh, I'd like from you to get a sense as to what needs to be, what needs to be done. I know that uh, on a concrete level, so behind us we have these 32 telescopes, right? 42. 40, sorry, Life, 42. the universe, and everything. Right, so, so, but that would imply perhaps that we don't need any more, but, but no. we do. But we do actually need more than 42. And there are plans to develop uh, a, a much larger array. In fact, there, my understanding is there are several tier plans of developing a much larger array so as to have increased sensitivity to the data, so as to be able to, uh, to, to work more effectively, so basically to be able to do a much better job at, at scanning the sky for signals, as well as doing other radio uh, astronomy and, and other issues. Um, so there's clearly more infrastructure, but uh, there are all sorts of things, presumably, that SETI, SETI needs. Uh, and you have decided to, as I said, step up and, and, and become really a permanent fundraiser in terms of money and also awareness and participation. So, uh, so what's that all about? What do you need? Um, what would I make you happy? What could I, I give you? Ultimately, ultimately what SETI needs is an endowment. Right? This, this kind of project, which might be multi-generational, you know, this huge high stack and right. we're trying to search um, doesn't do well with the annual funding cycles. Um, we were a NASA project for a while. It didn't fit with the congressional cycles. It was too easy a target for little green men and ha, 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 and there you go. No SETI funding. In terms of um, annual campaigns and fundraising from the public, which we're doing now, again, um, since you can't deliver something each year as a concrete 
here, here's a brick he bought. Right. Well, you can buy a telescope. Right. That's fine, and we need 350 of them eventually. Um, or maybe 500. I think the valley's big enough to, to fit 500 in, but um, an endowment seems like the right thing to be going after at mm -hmm. the moment. Um, we need to uh, be, be cognizant of the fact that when we built observatories in the past, we have often failed to fund the scientific research there. You fund the instrument, right. but you don't fund the yeah, scientific pretty. research. Right. Here we need to fund the instrument, but we also need to provide funding for the smart young people who are going to do the next big thing right. with the instrument. Um, think of the next new signal processing capability. Bring in the next new technology. Uh, make it all happen. You know, SETI is in some sense a long shot scientifically. You have to be enjoy the process of developing the technology as you go along because you can't guarantee that you're going to get a payoff of a signal in your lifetime. Right. So you have to enjoy the journey. So we're asking people to, to take kind of a step, a leap, to go in that direction. Not all scientists want to do that sort of thing. But to um, have their future financial situation at risk is, is a huge. Sure. There are long shots and there are long shots. I mean, there's a scientific long shot in terms of we're going to be able to find a signal tomorrow or in the next five years or 10 years. But that doesn't stop, of course, somebody from being able to make uh, significant developments in terms of technology, in terms of signal processing, in terms of all the other science which, which, which can and will be done. And I think having money not only gives you uh, the, the, the infrastructure to be able to do the science, but it sends a very strong message to the scientific community that come here and prosper in this particular avenue and help us to, be, to, to achieve all that we can achieve scientifically and you won't be frozen out. You won't be taking this horrible career risk. And, and draw in the next generation right. that you can help uh, to mentor and train and inspire. You mentioned, you mentioned political games very, very briefly with Congress and funding and all the rest of that. So I don't want to go, go into, the, in, into the details of that, but I guess You want to talk about us being the four-letter S word that you couldn't say at NASA headquarters? Well, to a certain extent, I do. I don't want to go into the who said what, but I, I want to get into this, this, this sense of maybe I'm, maybe I'm being hopelessly naive, but, um, but if, if SETI is, a, is an easy target for Congress, or, or, or some cranky congressman or some people because it has some flakiness associated right. with it or they perceive it has some flakiness or they're using it to further their own agenda. At some level, at some level that might be, not, not wholly, but that might be able to be combated directly by more vigorous outreach, by more vigorous uh, educational techniques to let people from all stripes know, no, this is serious science, this is important, here's the educational component. How many congressmen do you know have actually come here, who have been involved in SETI, who have had the opportunity to talk to you, who know about the, the, the serious goals and aspirations of, of the organization? Because, um, I mean, hopefully, the more people are aware of, of what it is that you're doing, the less SETI ha will, will become, or, the, or the, the smaller the risk that it will become a political football and be thrown out as, as some sort of bizarre government waste of, you know, the, these guys in Washington, they buy 500 billion pens and they fund extraterrestrial research. You know, I mean, that, exactly. that, 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 that kind of silliness, which is so, so, clearly, uh, so clearly erroneous. Um, is it, can, can some of that at least be, be minimized or eliminated through better outreach, through better awareness, through better, uh, better interaction with, with the broad citizen base and also the politicians? Well, I think it, SETI isn't alone in that um, the need for politicians to be informed and educated. Um, stem cell research isn't doing all that well in, in the uh, congressional venue. Um, so yes, telling people about what we're doing, having you help us tell people about what we're doing. Phenomenal. We do as much of that as we possibly can. Um, but I think actually what I'm trying to say is that even if we could educate the Congress, that still it's an annual funding cycle right. and other more immediate concerns, sometimes totally out of our control, uh, affect that funding cycle. Sure. 
So, so you need when an you take something that's such a long-term project, I think you need to build an endowment. So how much do you need for your endowment? Well, if, if we only need a couple of million dollars a year, then your endowment's going to be on the order of 40 million, right? Um, if, you need, if you need more, you have to build that up to, to more. Um, I take heart in the fact that once I decided that I needed to do the fundraising because it was getting pretty critical, right. um, at any one time in this country, there are something like 140 programs each trying to raise $100 million. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. I, I was startled. Um, of course, there's the question of how many of them actually raise $100 million. But that's right. But, but the point is, there is that kind of capacity. And, and, for, and actually, I just mentioned this country. That's, that's where silly. I wanted to go. It should be global. This is planet this Earth, is after Exactly. All. This is a global thing. And that's where we're not doing a very good job. We don't have a lot of outlet to the rest of the world. I can go and give only so many talks. Um, so we need, that's one of the reasons I hope that SETI Live, which definitely has a global audience of citizen scientists, I hope we can reach them and have them engage you know, their neighbors. You know who you should talk to? You know who, in, in, in my humble opinion, are the most forward-thinking uh, planetary citizens who actually have money and use it in intelligent ways? The Norwegians. These, these guys, they're really smart, and they fund all sorts of things for, to stop environmental degradation. And, and this tiny little country of four million people, sure, they got a lot of oil, but they're really forward-thinking people. You should go uh, go talk to the Norwegians. I think that sounds like a good idea. I think they, uh, but but I mean the the point that this is this is really a global project, and 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 of course you have to have infrastructure base somewhere. But this is something which is in the direct interests of everyone on planet Earth, uh, and there's no reason why it shouldn't be a project which is supported and scaled up so that it can be really of, of planetary dimension. And of course, that's the only way it, it, it has to go. I mean, you were talking about signals maybe coming from, from a galaxy, for goodness sakes. I mean, think about that. Think about people coordinating from different stars to be able to beam something out of, of, of such a huge, <laughs> huge area. Yes. It's mind-boggling. If we can't even get people on our, on our planet <laughs> together to actually recognize that these sorts of things are important, then, uh, then it doesn't bode very well for our ability to be able to survive in the longer term. It doesn't, and I think um, there's, again, going back to Philip Morrison, he had a phrase that encapsulates that all so beautifully. He liked to refer to SETI as the archaeology of the future. Right. Right? <laughs> Tyranny of light speed, we learn about their past, but if we succeed in detecting a signal, we learn that it's possible for us to have a long future. And that is such an important message that uh, it makes it worthwhile working on this project. It is. Well, Jill Tarter, may you and SETI have the longest possible future. I wish you all the best, and it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank and you very much. It's been my pleasure. And uh, welcome again <laughs> to, to our unusual-looking telescope.